This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Chapter 8 deals with internal control and the implications of fraud. And first of all, what's meant by internal control? Um, and in, internal control, and th- thinking of it particularly from a, an accounting perspective, is a way how you stop things going wrong, or if they do go wrong, uh, how do you detect it? So, for example, if you took a, an organization with poor internal control, uh, let's say it got invoices coming in from suppliers. If it was careless and had dealt with those invoices, it would be possible to pay some of them twice. I mean, sometimes at home, you know, it's difficult to remember, have I paid the gas bill or not? You know, you have to go looking at your, your, your bank records to, to find out. Uh, and, that, and that's at home where you haven't got that many payments to make. Uh, think what it's going to be like in a, in a company where there's maybe thousands of purchase transactions a week. Uh, how is anyone going to know whether something has been paid or not unless it's a, basically a mechanism, a control, uh, which can tell them that or which prevents it being paid. So you know, a typical internal control on the payment of purchase invoices is to stamp it paid. Some organizations actually punch holes in it saying paid. So there's no chance whatsoever of it kind of accidentally or even deliberately going around the, the, the system again and being paid multiply. Uh, another example of internal control where it's needed uh, let's say people are paid overtime. What you don't want is people to claim for overtime that they haven't done or to kind of work overtime needlessly because it, it boosts uh, pay. So what you need to do in, in this case is to have maybe a system of authorization of overtime claims where a supervisor or manager signs a, a time sheet or something saying, yes, it's overtime was worked and it was authorized and so on. So these internal controls are necessary to safeguard the assets of the company, uh, to make sure that errors do not occur, uh, or if they do occur, that they're picked up and corrected. If you don't do this, then the system will, the company and its accounting system will descend into chaos. And it doesn't take a huge number of transactions which are badly controlled uh, before it does slip into chaos. Now, once it slips into chaos, then you have to think uh, how well will the board of directors be able to fulfill its function where it's supposed to be making proper decisions, but proper decisions based on what information. Uh, There are opening up the door for fraud, uh, of course, uh, uh, and just inefficiency and waste. It is the duty of the board of directors under corporate governance codes to ensure that there is a good system of internal control. So it must develop uh, clear internal controls which are understood by staff uh, and very important not just understood by staff but which are followed through by staff, which are obeyed if you like by staff. It's management's responsibility, it is not the auditor's responsibility uh, to ensure that there's good internal control The auditors might report that internal control is poor, they might report that to the managers, but it is not their responsibility uh, to make sure the control system is there and working. It's management's. The framework of controls, there's two things really. First of all, there is the control environment, uh, which we'll uh, uh, look at uh, now I think, yeah. And then later on on the next slides we'll be looking at control processes and procedures. Uh, And then we'll see what might be necessary for the commitment of fraud and what sorts of kind of frauds might might possibly uh, exist. So first of all the uh, internal control environment, control environment. What's meant by control environment? And what's meant by a control environment really is almost the culture in the organization. 
uh, some organizations, if you like, the, the, the people at the top or maybe the person at the top of a small organization is a great believer in controls, likes order, likes things to be well recorded and checked and signed off and so on. A very kind of particular person. In other organizations, the person at the top or the people at the top are in a way naturally careless. They don't like recording stuff in, in, in great detail. They see that all of this recording and, uh, and, and so on and authorizing stuff, they see it time consuming. They see that it's always getting in the way of making a profit. And I suppose we could almost take two organizations, one uh, which was started by an accountant and of course accountants know the importance of internal control. They tend to almost naturally like things to be tidy and well ordered. And the accountant is now the chief executive officer. You can see that that organization would have a controlled environment which is very supportive of order. It's very supportive of making sure that there are good controls. Let's say for the sake of argument, we had another organization that was started by a salesperson. The salesperson is now head of the company. Salespeople, and, and it's not meant to be criticisms, uh, but maybe a slightly separate uh, emphasis on what's important in an organization. They can find filling in forms tedious. Uh, they are much more interested in getting the next deal done and, and making the sale. That's where they get their real satisfaction. Uh, and if this person was the chief executive officer, you can see how they would be, shall we say, less fussy, maybe, less supportive of the internal controls. And of course, in some organizations, the person at the top sees internal controls as a way of preventing them, uh, perhaps uh, making transactions which are illegal, or perhaps carrying out fraudulent transactions of another sort. Uh, and they don't support internal controls because the, the supportive internal control environment here would make it more difficult for them to act in a, an illegal or, a, or an ambiguous sort of a way. So the first thing we need in place, ideally, is the control environment, because if you have a poor control environment, it doesn't really matter how good your processes is, are in theory, in practice, these processes and procedures, if the control environment is not appreciated and treasured, these processes and procedures will probably not be carried out. They will fall into disuse. Whereas in the favorable control environment, they are going to be very much supported. So what sort of uh, control uh, procedures uh, uh, do we have? And here is uh, an example of uh, control procedures which we've uh, uh, got. In, in general, uh, here we'll be looking uh, in, in computer controls in the next slide, a little bit more detail uh, here. Uh, so first of all, authorization. Authorization is a fantastically important control. You can authorize nearly everything, uh, although you have to remember that sometimes the cost of the control is maybe outweighing the benefits you get from it. But typically, you would authorize uh, a purchase order for the purchase of new equipment uh, or new inventory. You don't want people going out and buying new computers and so on, which are not going to be needed. Uh, you would authorize people's overtime. You would authorize uh, the hiring of new people uh, and so on. You'd be authorizing maybe the credit limit for a new customer. And it is somebody in authority who would normally be signing something as authorization. And it's great because the auditors, when they're doing their audit, they can go to these documents and they can look for the right person's signature and say, yes, the internal control system is working correctly. Computer controls, we'll see in a minute. Comparison to budget. You have a budget which says that expenses this month should be 25,000 and you look at the actual and you see expenses are 35,000. Anyway, two things or three things might have happened. First, the budget might be wrong, obviously. Uh, second, uh, maybe expenses went up for some very good reason. Uh, but third, uh, there may be something going wrong with the internal control system. Uh, we are spending too much. Maybe, maybe somebody has ordered stuff twice and they shouldn't have. Maybe we are misaccounting for some of the purchases and have kind of put the invoices through twice and so on. This uh, indicates here 
uh, that there's a kind of departure. This is what we expect. This is what has happened. Let's find out why there's this disparity and make sure it's not due to an error uh, of some sort. Uh, arithmetic controls. Arithmetic controls, uh, you get an invoice from a supplier. Uh, how do you know they've made out the invoice correctly? So you've bought uh, 35 units and they've cost you $71 each. Uh, you want to make sure that 35 times 71 is a figure which appears over there and then you're 15% or 20% or 21% or 23%, whatever your sales tax is, has been added on correctly. Maybe a little bit less important now that so much of this is done by computers, that it's probably going to be right. Uh, but there are, it's still worth making sure the computer is doing it correct. Uh, and if you were uh, doing uh, a lot of uh, work, let's say, manually preparing the, uh, the wages and salaries, quite complicated calculations, People could easily go wrong. Maybe your internal control is you do it, and then somebody else double checks it to make sure it's correct. Uh, accounting uh, uh, reconciliations, great. Uh, accounting reconciliations, uh, typical one, a bank reconciliation. Your cash book says you have $12,000. Uh, the bank in its bank statement says you have $11,000. How come there's a thousand different? And it might be simply a tiny difference uh, in, in when money goes through the bank and when you know about it, but it might indicate that you've made an error in your cash book accounting. Similarly, you may get statements from your suppliers. The supplier says you owe me 5,000, you say I owe you only 3,000. Maybe the 2,000, the source there is an error in your accounting, or maybe this you simply recently paid your supplier and the supplier hasn't received and accounted for it yet. But again, it's, it's, the great thing about reconciliation is they're quite often to external pieces of evidence. You are comparing your records to somebody else's records, and it's a fantastically strong piece of internal control. Physical control really means physical protection of assets. For example, cash. If there's any substantial amounts of cash, lock them away. Ideally, put them in the bank overnight. You don't want the thousands of dollars kind of sitting around in, in, in shops and things because it is opening up the way to uh, theft. Uh, you, don't want, you also want to reduce the, the possibility of staff stealing as well. There is a physical control of non-current assets. Some non-current assets like a laptop computer are very desirable, very portable. Uh, and, and, and of course, they often disappear. Uh, but maybe what you should do is you should uh, lock them down. Uh, maybe you should uh, put on um, uh, markings, indelible markings, so they can be traced and so on there. And the third place that really physical control will come in is inventory. If you are in a company like a, a jewellery company where you've got very small, high-value items, locking it away, physical control is hugely important. Uh, in engineering companies, they often have stores which are kind of locked. You have a storeman. Goods are only issued on proper requisitions and so on. People can't just go in and help themselves. Maintaining a trial balance and control accounts. Uh, make sure your trial balance, your balances. Uh, again, it's less likely it's going to go astray with computer accounting. And normally make sure your debits and credits the same way. Uh, control accounts uh, here, making sure that the sum of your receivables balances adds up to the control account, the total receivables balance which you have. Uh, and again, if that goes astray, you, you need to investigate it. And finally, something that needs a little bit of explaining, segregation of duties. Segregation of duties means that you are reluctant to let one person uh, to do all of a transaction. If one person can do all of a transaction, it, it's, even if that person is honest, uh, you are relying on that one person, in a way, getting it right. There, there's no other mind or scrutiny brought, brought to bear on it. Uh, and to some extent, if you make an error, certainly if you make an error of principle, you will never, ever see that you've made an error. You simply don't understand that. Segregation of duties means that you break up a transaction so that several people are involved. 
So typically, if you were dealing with the purchase of goods, uh, one person would produce what's called a purchase requisition, saying, I would like to order a thousand of these. This would go to somebody in the purchasing department uh, who would maybe ring round and find the, the best supplier. And they would uh, issue the purchase order to that supplier. Somebody in stores would receive the goods and count the goods as they came in to make sure that what was received is the same as what was ordered. Uh, somebody in accounting would receive the invoice uh, and they would receive the invoice and make sure that the goods have been ordered, the goods have been received and so on. So we've got about five people involved in that transaction. If only one person was involved in it, one person ordered the goods, one person received the goods, and then the same person organized the payment of the goods, uh, apart from errors occurring where they get it wrong, maybe ordering too many goods and paying for them, uh, you are, of course, laying yourself open to fraud. If you can order the goods, receive the goods, and pay for the goods with nobody else getting involved, well, uh, you can order them and get them delivered to home or to a friend and then pay for them, and nobody's going to be any the wiser. Segre segregation of duties is fantastically important. It's possible or desirable or required almost in large organizations where you have enough people to break up the transactions. Quite difficult in small organizations where there's maybe only one bookkeeper, only a couple of people uh, are dealing with it. And uh, what you tend to rely on there, instead of segregation of duties, if they're small organizations, it should be easier for the managing director to keep a, or the, or the chief accountant, to keep a very watchful eye on everything which is going on. This uh, here is uh, dealing really with um, internal control procedures, particularly in uh, an IT environment. And here, what we need uh, to keep our accounting records safe if they're maintained on computer is first of all, access controls, physical access controls, lock away the file server so that the, the, the very valuable information which is held there is safeguarded. And, and in computer systems, it's not the hardware itself which tends to be the valuable thing. It is the information it holds. It is the list of people who owe you money, for example. It is the, the list of uh, what you've agreed to pay your employees. It's the data, the information which is valuable. So make sure it is safeguarded. Make sure that before it can be changed or even accessed, uh, that uh, people, only authorized people are allowed to do it. Maybe they have a special log on with a special password. In, in some modern systems, they, they have kind of a, um, ways, it's like a, not a kind of physiological ways of uh, uh, letting people get access. Sometimes you, you swipe a finger uh, over a reader. Some very modern systems uh, look at uh, iris scans and so on there. And they won't allow people maybe to see the data or to amend the data unless these kind of physical characteristics are verified. Integrity controls, uh, input controls. Um, uh, with computer systems, once an error gets into the system, if you're not careful, the system carries on with that error uh, without any real common sense being brought to bear on it. Uh, so it's very important that you uh, carefully control input to stop errors getting in in the first place. And there are a number of ways of, of dealing with this. For example, an edit check. Uh, an edit check could look at the, the size of the range of the data. So if somebody was putting in hours worked in a week, uh, maybe you stop them putting in anything longer than 60. Or if they put in something longer than 60, it needs special authorization. That is a, a form of edit check. Uh, another form of edit check is you can't, if somebody's putting in a date, uh, you can put in month 13. Uh, you may have been uh, kind of surprised by edit checks you're putting in your credit card number and it comes back and immediately says this is not a valid number because you've mistyped and, uh, and so on. This is, these are ways of trying to prevent incorrect data getting in. Backup controls are important. You have all of this information sitting on magnetic media normally. Uh, uh, Sometimes it can be written over by error. Uh, it may be subject to physical damage 
uh, water damage, fire damage, smoke damage, and so on there. Uh, what happens if uh, your entire system gets damaged? You, you, you're effectively trading on the internet. You are like a, an airline. You take all your bookings of the internet and your system breaks down. It's not even damage particularly caused. It's just the, the system breaks down. For every hour that a system breaks down, you cannot be making sales. Uh, and you may be losing bookings which have been made and so on. So what uh, companies do who rely on being online, rely on the systems operating to trade, it's not just a backup uh, copy of data, they sometimes have a, a whole parallel system sitting in another city. And they kind of, these two systems work in parallel. And if one of them goes down, the other one just can, kind of continues on seamlessly. So for this kind of disaster planning for large organizations, really important. Theft and fraud, uh, theft and fraud of uh, maybe data on the computer, fraudulently uh, changing information on the computer and so on, uh, has to be countered and uh, thought about. Uh, again, physical safeguards will be coming uh, into that. Uh, you can also, for example, get the computer to print out exceptionally large transactions, because maybe exceptionally large transactions are the ones where the, the, the fraud is being made. If you're on the internet, it's very important that you protect yourself from uh, virus attacks, hacking attacks, and so on. Uh, you need to have uh, firewalls to stop external people coming in and perhaps changing the uh, information uh, to their own advantage. And finally, systems development controls. Systems development controls look at changing the computer program. For example, what happens if the government changes sales tax? The sales program is changed, but instead of maybe uh, changing the, the sales tax to 20%, the programmer makes a mistake and changes it to 2%. This means that the sales tax lifted from your uh, customers is far too low, but the government will want it. The government will claim it as though you had charged 20% uh, and suddenly have to more or less lose 20% of your revenue, or you didn't expect to lose it, uh, could of course uh, cause a company to go into liquidation. Citizens development uh, controls also uh, leave open the way to fraud. Uh, a, a programmer who is dishonest uh, can put special entry points into a program which maybe uh, allow uh, amounts to be paid out without going through the, the normal procedures and, and, and the like. So, fraud. Fraud is uh, an intentional act involving uh, deception to gain an unjust or uh, uh, illegal advantage. And really there are two types of fraud. There is financial reporting fraud. For example, uh, you uh, are hoping maybe to raise money from the bank or raise money from shareholders. Uh, you know that the bank or shareholders will be reluctant to, to give you the money unless you show good profits. And so you report artificially high profits and suck these investors into investing in a company uh, which is really not a safe one. Or you think somebody's going to buy you uh, and to get a good price, you inflate the profits and, and so on within the company, you leave out liabilities. Uh, so the company looks a nice safe one. And when they bought the company, they find it's on its last legs, really. So that's financial reporting fraud. Financial reporting uh, fraud is not something uh, which is something which would appear really in the financial statements. Financial statements would be stated, but auditors do not set themselves out to prevent or detect fraud. They're not looking after every little fraud, certainly. Uh, but if there is a material fraud, so that the financial statements are materially misstated, uh, they should find material financial reporting errors. 
misappropriation of assets, this is the theft of cash, non-current assets or inventory, in the more kind of internal fraud which, which we have. For fraud to occur, you need three elements to be in place. First of all, you need incentive. Uh, you need uh, something which in a way pushes people to commit the fraud. Uh, and it could be like a shortage of money at home, financial pressure. We'll see a slide in a moment which talks about it. You need opportunity. Uh, but those two aren't enough. Uh, I, for example, might be short of cash. That would be my incentive. I have an opportunity because I see a lot of cash sitting in the till of the shop, so I could steal it. Uh, but only if my attitude is a kind of dishonest attitude will I actually take the final step, if you like, and take the money out of the till. So we need all three to be there. So here is a kind of a summary of some of the... Uh, uh, the ways in which fraud might happen. Uh, so if we look at financial reporting fraud there, we didn't look at all of them, but just to give you an idea, uh, what sort of incentive might we have? Uh, and what we can have there, maybe, uh, is the directors, and the directors pay the bonuses linked to profit. Uh, and so if they overstate profit, then they will get more pay. And there's a clear kind of uh, in incentive uh, through the pay structure to commit fraud. Uh, profitability threatened, pressure to conform. Maybe what the, uh, the directors are worried about there is losing their jobs. So if they come in with profits which are disappointing to the shareholders, the shareholders may lose patience and ask the, you know, to force the directors to leave. And so to keep your job, you overstate what's, what's, what's going on. Or maybe what's happening uh, is you see a takeover, maybe the directors have some shares, they want a good price in the takeover, and again, overstate the, uh, the profits and the health of the company to get a good price. Opportunities, uh, lots of estimates, uh, so the, the directors can nearly put in whatever figure they want, maybe on the, uh, the, the sale value of inventory or profitability of contracts and so on. This is the one that a lot of the uh, corporate governance stuff is getting at. This dominant chief executive who comes in, just tells people, do this, do this, do this, cuts through all the internal controls, leaves a way completely open for fraud. And poor internal controls. Poor internal control gives fantastic opportunity for fraud to occur. You do something, there's no segregation duties, the chances of somebody finding out about it are small. And finally, uh, here, uh, some of the, the attitudes. Uh, maybe there has been no good ethical guidance given to people about what's uh, acceptable. Uh, maybe they're just naturally not very honest people in charge of the, uh, the, the company. Uh, maybe they uh, like meeting their aggressive targets. They're quite an aggressive person. They don't want ever to be seen to be failing and, and so on. Uh, maybe they're kind of almost resentful against the company and they say I've been working really hard my pay isn't great oh I, I want to boost my bonus because I don't think I've been treated very fairly misappropriation of assets here personal uh, financial pressure a dislike of your employer you get your own back and your employer has, has shouted at you so you say okay you shouted me I'm going to steal the petty cash uh, greed uh, I think you all understand uh, that greed from uh, certainly some seen, seen aspects of it, not from ourselves, of course, but other people. Uh, opportunity, a high value portable stock like jewelry, cash based businesses. It's very easy for cash to go missing and so on. Poor internal controls. And then down here, uh, uh, the attitude. And interesting one is other people's behavior almost gets to. The, the culture of control, they call it the control environment here. If you're working in a business and you see that all your colleagues uh, claim more on their expenses than really they spend, they inflate maybe taxi fares, trade fares, entertainment costs, whatever. If everybody's doing it, 
it's in a way quite hard for you to resist because you begin to think, well, everybody's doing it. It must be, it must in a way be allowed by the company. Uh, and in fact, maybe the company doesn't allow it at all. Maybe, but you, you, you're on a kind of, you can be sucked in. It's a kind of slippery slope, uh, which could be uh, present. The implications of fraud, uh, which we've got uh, here, uh, are these uh, here. It will, um, can hurt you financially once a fraud has been discovered. Uh, then people may not want to deal with you. Uh, it will hurt your share price almost certainly. It's difficult to measure what your performance is. Uh, and of course, if, if, if customers have been affected by the fraud, uh, then, then they, you know, they might not come back to you uh, at all. Uh, there may be legal consequences of uh, misrepresentation. Uh, if you induce a, a company into buying you or a shareholder into investing you based on incorrect information, deliberately incorrect information, and there's probably legal consequences to that. Uh, if the internal reporting is wrong, the financial reporting is wrong, uh, then you'll be making incorrect decisions. You think you're very profitable. Uh, therefore, you decide to expand. Uh, but in fact, you're not very profitable. And the, the decision to expand was not the one you should be making at all. And reputation. Companies are often very embarrassed about fraud. Uh, they like to quite cover them up. Quite often uh, in companies don't want to take fraudsters to court because of the bad publicity. They'd rather just kind of pay this person off rather kind of quietly there because it implies that maybe their internal control and uh, the systems are not very good. Uh, and then they begin to worry about the uh, attitudes of customers. Detecting and preventing fraud Good control systems is what we need. We want a good control environment, of course, and good control systems. Uh, you want a, a good ethics within the company, uh, ethical codes and so on. This is primarily de dealing with uh, financial reporting fraud, but can also uh, affect uh, um, misclaiming expenses and so on. Uh, and training people, training people to follow the internal control system training people maybe to be willing to whistleblow, uh, training people maybe how to detect fraud in certain situations, uh, and if they do detect fraud, uh, how it should be reported within the business. As I said, the responsibility of preventing detecting fraud is the directors, not the auditors. Though, as I say, if there is a materially uh, important fraud, then the, 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 the auditors should be able to discover material misstatements, large misstatements from uh, whatever cause. And finally, there's two slides on um, money laundering uh, and proceeds of crime and, uh, and so on. So money laundering is a process uh, whereby uh, you want to present the proceeds of criminal act activity uh, as having come from legitimate processes. So the proceeds of criminal activity are converted, are, are cleaned, laundered, if you like, into uh, proceeds or assets which appear to come from proper businesses. And there are three steps in money laundering, uh, so there are. First of all, you have to, I mean, I, mean, I think of money laundering as, let's say, drug money. Uh, let's say somebody has a lucrative uh, business selling drugs. And so you've got you know, tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, perhaps, sitting around. If they just begin spending that, uh, then somebody's going to notice. And if somebody notices, they'll say, where's he got the money? He's not got a job. So the first stage is to find uh, an excuse, if you like, a reason for where this money has come from legitimately. And this is called placement. Uh, and where it's, it's very good for placement is a cash-based business. Uh, so if it's a cash-based business, you just say there were more customers. So if you took, for example, a casino, 
uh, it, it's quite hard in a casino uh, to keep track of customers' losses, so to speak. You just say, well, we had a lot of people in tonight and they lost a lot of money. They gambled heavily, they lost a lot of money. And what you're actually doing is you're taking some money you want, but adding to it lots of this drug money. Uh, and so you're saying, I made a, you know, a big, big winning in the casino. Uh, other places that have been used in money laundering are laundrettes, again, cash-based business, uh, people putting in, lots of different people putting coins into the machines and so on. Taxi businesses been used for money laundering. Uh, and again, it's very hard to, to, to say um, what is proper taxi fares uh, and what has simply been a boost in taxi fares coming from the wrong money. So this gets it kind of in into the uh, uh, economy from a uh, kind of legitimate uh, reason, if you like, or what you can claim is a legitimate source. Then what uh, money launders are frightened of is losing it. Many companies, uh, a big one, many countries have legislation which allows the police and the authorities to seize drug money, say, uh, from the criminal. So these criminals, they think, well, I've, I've, I've explained this as coming from my taxi business, uh, but if the, the police ever find out about it, then what they are able to do is be able to follow this money and they see from this money, from my taxi business, I bought a very nice house. And the police will say, well, really, you bought that house with drug money. I will have the house. Thank you very much. So what people try to do is they, they lay a very confused pathway to, to kind of separate the drug money from where, where the money is going to anyway, end up. And this is the, the process of layering. So what you will do is you take your money from your taxi business, you take it out and you pay it into a bank account. And you take it out of that bank account, put it into another bank account, then into another bank account abroad, another bank account abroad. It goes in, out, in, out, in, out, all around the world kind of thing. And it's, uh, and it's very quickly, if you like, or becomes very difficult for the authorities to track exactly what money is going where, especially if it kind of breaks up into different different amounts and kind of comes together and so on. This is layering. This is laying really a, 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 a confused trail. And then what we have to do is having sentiments holidays around the world, we have to try and get it back so we can actually enjoy it, finally enjoy it. So what we might do uh, here is we say, uh, uh, maybe uh, can I get money back to this country authorities say, where did you get that? Well, you say, well, it was from maybe uh, the sale of assets abroad. Uh, or, or you might be able to say, well, I won it on gambling or something of that sort. Uh, but some said, even if they don't believe you, uh, to track it all the way back through this layering process to the taxi business, then say, well, that was a money laundering business. It, it makes you safer. So placement layering and integration here, uh, integration of final steps so that you can eventually enjoy it. If it comes from a legitimate business activity, you will, of course, pay tax on it. But uh, paying tax uh, almost legitimizes it. You say, it must be okay, I pay tax on it. And losing 30% to tax, whatever it is, is better than losing all of it uh, because of money laundering. In the UK, uh, there are uh, quite strict rules. This is just giving you uh, an example of, of the sort of legislation which we have in the UK on this here, uh, which auditors have to be a bit cautious about. Three criminal activities. First, we hope no accountant will ever do this. Uh, there is laundering itself, that the, the, the accountant uh, is a party to the laundering, actually arranges the uh, uh, the placement and the layering and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so that's 14 years in jail, perhaps, and you lose the money. Uh, where auditors are, or, or accountants are more likely to get involved with money laundering uh, is you think, for example, one of your clients is, is doing it. The client is showing income and you don't quite believe that the business could be really that successful or an amount is paid into their bank account and there's no invoice, yeah? So you have a suspicion then 
uh, that the only rational explanation for this money appearing in the business is that it is laundered. If you have that suspicion, you have to report that to the authorities, otherwise you can be up to five years in jail. But the sting in the tail is, you mustn't tell the client that you have uh, reported this. This is known as tipping off. Because as soon as you say to a client, oh, by the way, I've told the police I think this is money laundering, the client is going to cover all the, all the tracks and so on, going to leave the country maybe and so on. Uh, so you mustn't warn anybody that you've done the tipping off. But of course, this is a this is kind of interesting balance here. Uh, you find some money, you're not quite sure of its source. You're not quite sure that you believe the client that where this money has come from. You've asked the client once for an explanation. You're not happy with the explanation. You could ask them again. Still unhappy. If you keep asking them for an explanation, then of course, in a way, you are going into tipping off. Uh, but you don't want to report them without making sure that there isn't an innocent explanation. So you're having to kind of balance in a bit of a tightrope here. You don't want to be reporting stuff that, that's maybe completely innocent, but you don't want to pursue the matter so much uh, that any client with any common sense will say, well, this person's got real suspicions here. I'm sure they've gone and, and told the authorities because essentially you would have tipped, tipped them off.